Good morning and welcome to Sunday services. Um, our call to worship this morning is Psalm 96, 1 through 6. If you want to stand and, and join me, uh, feel free. Um, Psalm 96, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord has made the heavens. Splendor and majesty is before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's sing out to the Lord this morning as we continue with, Lord, I lift your name on high. and prayers praises and prayers and so um praises and prayers how where do we go with that kurt's not here to do that union meeting, union meeting. I, th I thought maybe did he tell me about that because i seems like i thought that but i wasn't sure so anyway let's pray for kurt he's at a union meeting so <laughs> that's always a trying time and what any updates or praises or prayers okay Oh, okay. Wonderful. Oh, praise the Lord. All right. Yeah, keep that. Just keep Mike in the prayer as well, as he goes through what he's going through. Um, we made it back safely. Praise the Lord. It's great to be back. And fall decorations are up. Didn't fall a pretty time of year. Amen. God does an amazing job. Other praises or prayers? Anybody? Okay. Okay. Niece. Okay. Um, Paul. H U L L. Hall. Okay. 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 Um, 
all election and stuff, all the nation for sure. Amen. Our nation needs peace, needs Jesus. Yes, yeah. Really bad. Yeah. And people, Christians need to make a difference, realize that they can make a difference. And so let's pray that, you know, that his servants rise up and do what's necessary. Um, and the personal announcement, I was just announcing 18 days ago, I started dieting again, finally. I mean, I've always had a diet, but the diet's been very poor. <laughs> Eat whatever I want, seafood, right? But I've lost 20 pounds in the last 18 days, so praise the Lord. That makes me feel really good, so I'm happy about that. Um, and I went to the doctor and didn't get bad news, kind of bad news, not bad news, but... Um, I'm following in my father's footsteps, apparently. So I think I have neuropathy of my feet, the bottoms of my feet, kind of like what my dad had when he got to be about this age. So it's not, doesn't have a cause, but that they know of, but it's just something that um, I have at the moment. So we'll see. It might be because I had too tight of shoes, but don't know. <laughs> Otherwise, that's it. Any other praises or prayer requests? Let's go to the Lord for prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for this morning, this opportunity we have to come into this building as your people, as your church, and to, to come to praise you and to worship. But at this time, Lord, just to come and, and share our concerns and our burdens uh, with one another. Lord, as, as we lifted up at the end there, the, the nation and the election and all the stuff that's going on, there is so much divisiveness and so many um, words that are designed to, to hurt and anger and insult. And it's just, it's just a very trying time, Lord. And while we know that you have all things in your hands and that, that you will, will work all things for our good, um, when we look out there, at the, it, 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 it sometimes seems chaotic and seems divisive and it can cause us to get, get just to get downcast. But Lord, we know that you are the God of hope and the God of glory and the God of future. We trust in you for all things. And so, Lord, we put our trust in your hands and we ask that you give us the courage to continue to be your people about your business, whether that business is the business of spreading your love and your compassion and your mercy, preaching the good news to the lost, or even being citizens of this country and doing what we need to do in this election. Lord, help us to have the courage to do that and to stand. Lord, we've lifted up the names of a couple people who are, who are going through uh, cancer and other treatments. And, 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 and Lord, we just pray that you will be in those situations and you will bring comfort and healing to them as they, as they seek this treatment. Um, and Lord, just travel safety for those who are traveling and all things. Lord, we come before you and we are humbled by your greatness, and we praise your glorious name because, Father, you are the, the great God. Jesus, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and this morning we're going to praise you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Forgot about birthdays and anniversaries, but we do not have any on the uh, schedule, so I assume we have no birthdays and anniversaries. All right. Let's sing Psalm 5. Thank you. 
right? Verse 4 really reminded me of what we see today out there, you know. They flatter with their tongue, no truth is found in their mouth. And like an open grave, their thoughts are bound with sin. It's the world we live in today, but God is good. Amen? He is our solid rock. Let's sing solid rock. prayer hymn is there is a redeemer and um, we'll stand on the last slide or the third slide Messiah, Holy One. Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Let's pray. 
Oh, Father God, we are so thankful that we have this opportunity to come into your presence as we sing praises to you and thank you for allowing us to have this time. And Lord, we do thank you for giving us your son, for leaving your spirit so that we are not orphans and for allowing us to participate in your work of reaching all corners of the, of the world for you. Lord, you are worthy to receive glory and praises from all men from every language, every nation, all tribes. Lord, you are worthy, and we are so thankful. And, Lord, one day we will stand in glory. We will stand before you. Um, your word tells us we will know as we're known. Today we see by the shadow. We have your word, but someday we will stand in your presence. And when that day comes, it will be a glorious day. But until then, Lord, we just ask that you continue to um, – Lead us with your spirit. Continue to give us the courage we need to stand uh, for truth and for righteousness, to go forth and preach your, your good news to the world because the world needs to hear that you came, Jesus, that you came and sacrificed your life for us, that we can have freedom from the bondage of sin, that we can walk in your righteousness. So, Lord, today we just come before you thankful and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Our communion hymn is in Christ alone. And Wendell, if you'll come up at the fourth verse, whatever, it's in, in for the communion meditation. My strength, my song, its cornerstone, its solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. The gift of life, the this is the power of God. consider the ancient Greek physician Hippo, Hippocrat, Hippocratic as the father of Western medicine. 
He understood the importance of following moral principles in the practice of medicine and is considered with the writings of the Hippocratic Oath, which still serves as an ethical guide for all today's medical doctors. One key concept of the oath is to do no harm. It implies that the physician will do only what he thinks will benefit his patients. The principle of doing no harm extends to our relationship with each other's in our everyday life. In fact, benevolence in, is the central of the New Testament's teachings about loving others. In reflecting on the law of God, Paul sees that love is the intent behind many biblical commands. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Each day, as we follow Jesus Christ, our Savior, we, are, we focus with the choices that will affect the lives of others. When we choose a course of action, we should ask ourselves, does this reflect Christ's concern for others? Or am I only concerned of myself? Such an intensive dem demonstrates the love of Christ that seeks to heal the broken and help those that are in need. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again that we have this opportunity to gather around this table and partake of this communion, this Lord's Supper as it were. Lord, you call us to do this in remembrance of your sacrifice of the sacrifice where you freely laid down your life to pay the ransom of our sin, to pay the debt in full. On the cross, you said, it is finished. You paid the price in full by your death, and you did that freely. And so, Lord, this morning, as we partake of this bread, which represents your flesh on the cross, and the juice that represents the blood that spilled for our sins, we just are humbly before you because you did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Allow us, Lord, to continue to walk in your righteousness, to, to, to be your people, to allow your spirit to guide us as we live the life that you have before us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I'm going to move this over here, probably more out of the way. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. You know, one of the things we did this morning, Benjamin and I moved this up here. I'm not sure why. I think we just wanted to see what it would look like. We're trying to figure out if we place some things at different spots, if it will be easier or harder. And he was looking and said he could read most of the words back where, behind Janice. But he's got younger eyes, so I don't know. Janice, how's the words look so far um, than the songs? Can you read them? <laughs> that was unintentional. <laughs> Great. You got a glare on the window? I have a big glare on the window. I cannot even see it, but I think... I think back there they don't have a glare on their window because of the angle. 
So bigger letters. I like it where it's over there and maybe put the other one up there. Like we said before, I think that'd be probably be easier. Yeah, that would work too. That would move it up another 10 feet, right? Yeah. So that would be helpful. We'll try that. Right, but nobody stands right there, and we actually can raise it up more. So, yeah, raise it up a little bit more and put it on the post. Right, I think that might be a good spot, or even right there at the front pew. All right, cool. All right, well, today we're going to go continue on with our 13 lessons in Christian doctrine. And as you can see, we went through a whole bunch of Christian doctrines God, Jesus Christ, the Bible, the church. We talked about faith as it is, as it is important in our. In our conversion to, to Christ for remission of sin. We talked about repentance and faith and repentance. Both of those are, are kind, of, kind of unique in that faith without works is dead. They're like the two sides of the same coin. You can't have faith that doesn't lead to works. I mean, it just doesn't work. I suppose if you're on your deathbed, you could have faith and you could die and it didn't lead to works, but faith without works is dead. You must have works should spring from faith. You can't do works to say, oh, look, I did great works. But same with repentance. Repentance should lead to transformation, right? And so we talked about that. We talked about baptism as a necessity for um, entering into the covenant. We talked about the Lord's Supper, prayer. We talked about giving in the Old Testament, giving in the New Testament. And today we are on the mission of the church. And this is a vitally important topic right? The mission of the church. And so today, as we go through the mission of the church, we're going to talk about what the mission of the church is, because it's important that we keep that in our forefront of our minds. If we don't have so many companies in this country went through a time in the 90s, in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, early, where they started realizing that if everyone in the company from the part-time so sometimes their employee to the employee, the CEO, if they all understand the mission of the company, then the company tends to do better because everybody has the same goal before them all the time. One person may be cleaning the toilets and one person may be vacuuming the floor and someone else may be out selling, but they all realize that what they're doing is for this purpose and it tends to help a company move forward, which they get that from the church. The church has a mission and mission that we keep before us. And if we lose sight of that mission, we become like a ship adrift where the sails are down and, and, and we have no control. We don't, have, we don't make any progress. So we need to know what the mission of the church is. We need to know what does mission mean? Uh, the Christianity is missionary by nature. We're going to look at some motives for mission, who is responsible for mission, and fi finally follow up with just a few um, pointers on some methods for missions and what that means. So when I say the mission of the church, I asked around the table yesterday, and Jedediah spoke right up and got it, what the mission of the church was, and I was so happy that he got that. But what is the mission of the church? In Matthew chapter 28, eight, verse 19 and 20, Jesus says to his disciples after he's been crucified, before he's been taken up, after his resurrection, he says, and Jesus came up to them and spoke to them saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I commanded you, and lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of age. And I realize that's not what I have up there, but I'm, re I'm reading another version in my head, so I hate when they switch Bible versions on me. So anyway, same thing though, Jesus says, here is the most concise mission statement of the church. Go everywhere and make disciples. This is the mission of the church. We are to make disciples of all nations, of every person. And as long as there's people out there, we're to continue to do that. And so, so we wanted to break that down. The mission of the church, therefore, 
Try that again. There you go. The mission of the church is to teach all men and women concerning Christ and bring them into a saving faith in him. Okay, that's number one. We're to teach all mankind about Christ and bring them into a saving faith in Christ. And then number two, what Jesus says there, is that we're to continue to teach these obedient believers until they are built up and established in Christ. So that's what, in, 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 in a nutshell, what he says in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And as long as I, as I said, as long as there's one lost person out there, we need to keep on doing this. This is the mission of the church. This is why the church was established on the earth, was to save mankind. It was through the church that his message would be brought out into the people and that people would come to him because God desires that none should perish, that all should be saved. Amen? Amen. That's the mission of the church, and that mission is worldwide. It's a worldwide mission. Ecclesi or, so we, we can say evangelization of the world is the mission of the church. Okay, so if, we, if, if evangelization, evangelization is defined as point number one and two up there, then evangelization is the mission of the church, evangelization of the world. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the duty of all mankind. This is why we are here is to bring mankind into a saving knowledge of him and, and, and to, to be built up, to continue to be established in him and all that that means, which means that we will be creatures, we will be servants that love him and love others, just as Jesus says, right? How can we as people who have been saved rest when we know that Jesus is the only way and there's people that we know that don't know Jesus? We were once lost and we know that the end result of being separated from God when we die is to be separated for eternity. And we know the the, just the glorious joy that we have of being in Christ, of being known by him. And so our whole goal, the mission of the church, is to bring that saving knowledge to others. Will all mankind accept it? No, they won't. People will reject the message, sadly. But our job is to preach the word, right? And and all that that establishes. So that's the mission of the church in a nutshell. So what does mission mean? And so mission, if, oops, let's go back one. Mission defined by the dictionary, basically there's two definitions. It says it's an important assignment carried out for a political, religious, or commercial purpose, typically involving travel. So it's an important assignment. <clears throat> like if I said, Jedediah, I'm going to give you a mission. I want you to run out to my truck. I want you to grab my gun and bring it back in here, right? That would be a mission, right? That would, you'd be on a mission. You had a purpose. You'd be on a mission. It's not necessarily political or religious or commercial, but you're on a mission, right? And then the other use of mission is it's a vocation or calling of a religious organization, especially a Christian one, to go out into the world and spread its faith. And so mission, as is used in the Bible, I guess, we're saying that it's an act of sending or a state of being sent with certain powers to do something, some special service. Or, or a calling to preach or spread religion. So in the, the word mission actually comes from the Latin word medo, and medo means I send. And in the Greek, in the New Testament, the word mission never appears. You won't find the word mission in the Bible, but in Greek, what we kind of translates into missions is the word apostello, and apostello means I send, the same as medo. And so the apostles, apostles, it comes from apostelos or apostello, and it means one who is sent with a purpose. So it means, it means someone that's sent on a mission. So the word apostle really means missionary. And so you had the 12 apostles, which were the special 
the apostles, right? And then you had Paul, which was an apostle. But then after that, there's a whole bunch of people in the New Testament that they're called apostles, that the word apostolos is used because they were sent with a purpose, with authority. And so they were sent, um, and that's what mission means, one who's sent with authority for his purpose. So one of the questions that often comes up when you talk about mission is people think of foreign mission. And, you know, I don't want to get confused here on the mission of the church and foreign mission. Foreign mission is part of the mission of the church, but the mission of the church is to reach all mankind everywhere, not just abroad, not just locally at home, but everywhere. And so foreign missions is, is encompassed within the mission of the church. Typically, people will break out foreign missions and call that missions, and they'll call local stuff either evangelism or benevolence or whatever they want to call that. But the mission of the church is to reach all mankind with the saving knowledge of Christ. So people will say, why send missionaries to other lands? They already have their own religion. Why do we want to send missionaries there? Why disturb or disrupt their, their cultures? You know, why, why should we do that? Why should we spend millions and millions of dollars to send missionaries to these other places when they already have their own religion? And obviously, you guys know the answer. If Christianity was just a religion amongst the world religions, right? If Christ, Jesus, was just a savior among saviors of the world, then there'd be no reason for us to do missions. If there were many ways for mankind to be saved, if there was many paths back to God, then every world, every culture in the world seems to have their religion and what it means to them on how to live in their worldview. But the problem is, that's not what Christianity says. In fact, if Christianity did not have its exclusivity claim, they would never have been persecuted by the Romans. The Romans had many, many different types of religions, and they were all san sanctioned by Rome because they could all coexist. You could be worshipers of any of the Greek gods, you know, these people worship Aphrodite. Ooh, Aphrodite is the best. And these people worship Zeus. Oh, Zeus is the best. And Rome had no problem with that. At some point, Rome, the Roman emperor even wanted to be called a god and wanted you to worship him. And people had no problem with that because there was no exclusivity. The Roman emperor didn't say, worship me and only me. He said, hey, you got all these gods out there. I'm one too. Worship me. But Christianity was not like that. When Christ came, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He, he established Christianity as the only way that mankind can be saved. And its exclusivity is why it was so persecuted in the world. And why it's so persecuted today. Have you ever met anybody that has a problem with the claims of Christ being the only way? I mean, I have many times. They, people do not like that. Two major reasons that Christianity is missionary by nature is because of its exclusive claims and its view of mankind. The exclusive claims, number one, Christianity claims to be the only religion of the world, right? God is not a God, but he is the only God. There is no other God. God says, I am God. There is no other. That was number one commandment. I am he. I created all things. There is no one like him. 1 Corinthians 8, 4, it says, therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world. And that there is no God but one. What Paul is saying there is that 
idols are just pieces of wood or sticks or whatever. They're, they're not gods. They have no special powers. And so when he's talking about eating meat sacrificed to idol, it doesn't have any meaning to us. There is nothing. That, there's no power in any of these things. There's no other gods. There's only one God. If Jesus Christ was just a, a savior and not the savior, then Christianity wouldn't be exclusive. But Jesus Christ is the only savior. Acts 4.12, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given to men by which we must be saved. Get that. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only way. And since Jesus is the only way, Christianity must be missionary. We must reach out to the world and let the world know that Jesus is the only way or mankind will die in their sins. The second reason is that um, missionary Christianity is missionary by nature is because of Christianity's view of mankind. Some, some cultures in the world, some people in the world today, and you'll hear it stated often, especially by the talking heads on the, you know, the out in Hollywood and stuff, they will say, oh, I believe all people are what? Good. All people are good. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I believe all people are good. How many of you believe all people are good? We're not. Not by nature. People are not good by nature. In fact, in fact, we know that people need salvation from sin because the Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. There is no one anywhere that has not sinned but for Jesus Christ. Amen? All mankind is in need of a Savior. That makes Christianity missionary. These are the two reasons the two right main reasons that Christianity is missionary um, by nature. They're the compelling forces because there is only one way and it's Christ. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which mankind must be saved. And all are lost for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. However, the third reason that Christianity is missionary by nature is because of Christ, who Jesus was. What did the word mission or apostello or mito mean? I sin and, and missionary was what? One who was sent with authority to do a special task or purpose, right? Jesus was the greatest missionary ever. He was the first missionary ever. He came, he left his culture, which was being with God, being God, in, in Philippians, it says, although he existed as God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to. And so he emptied himself of the glory of God and became like a man, became nothing, humbled himself and became a servant, being found in human likeness. He left the glory that he had to become mankind and over and over, we see that Jesus taught and commanded missions, and he was the greatest missionary. First John 4, 9 says, By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. God sent Jesus, mito, apostle, apost apostello. God sent Jesus into the world. He was a missionary. Luke 19, 10, for the son of man has come to seek and save that which was lost. He had a purpose, John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven, why? Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus was sent. Jesus was the greatest missionary. And who are we supposed, supposed to pattern our life after? Who are we supposed to become like in our, in our walk? Anybody? God. Jesus? Right, Jesus. So if Jesus was the greatest missionary, that's that's what Christianity should be, missionary, mission, missional by, by, by nature. Okay. 
going on to the next few points. Uh, motives for mission missions, and, and I got a few of them listed here. There's all sorts of motives for missions, but, but um, number one, we have been saved. Before we were saved, we were sinners. Some of us were really bad sinners. Some of us, you know, had, were just, we were, we were not nice people and God saved us and God forgave us. And what's really interesting is that when Christ died on the cross, he knew all of us. The Bible says that he knew me before I was born. He planned for my life. He knit me in my mother's womb. He established the day of my birth and the number of my days. God knew everything about me. And when Jesus was dying on the cross, he knew he was dying for me. And he knew he was paying the price for my sins. And not just the sins that I committed before I came to him, when, before I humbled myself and realized my need for a savior, but all my sins, even the sins after that, even the sins that I haven't committed yet today, he paid the price for that. And that should humble me. That should make me desire I mean, just see that grace, it was overwhelming. And then to see other people who, are, who don't have that. It should be, it should create in me a desire to, to spread the good news to those who don't, don't have it. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God loved us. We should love others that much. Amen? We should give the, 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 the word to them. That's one of the motivations for, for missions. The other one, Christ commanded it. All four gospels and the book of Acts all has the primary mission of the church listed in some format. I didn't list them out there, but all of them have the commands to go to make disciples because that is the primary purpose of the church. We are not our own. We are not, we, he did not create us for us to be about our own purpose. He created us to be about his purpose and his purpose is to seek and save the lost through us. Christ commanded it. Number three, I put down, there's just gratitude for salva salvation. Paul says that um, he was under no obligation or he was under obligation, both the Jews and the Greeks um, and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. He felt obligated because of what God did for him. He felt obligated to do it for others. You won't say the, remember that whole used to be out there. People talked about pay it forward, pay it forward. That's the ultimate pay it forward. <laughs> You've been given a great gift. Give that gift to someone else, right? Amen. So now the question is, who is responsible for missions? The missionaries? Yep, the missionaries, yay. But that's not the answer here, right? Who is responsible for missions? If you look throughout scripture, the book of Acts is a good one because the book of Acts is where we finally see Christ being taken up to heaven, the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples, the birth of the church. And as the church is born, we see... Um, People, not the apostles, not the, the ones that were sent with authority, but we see other people like deacons. When they first established the deacons, Philip, he, he was known in Acts 21.8, they called him Philip the Evangelist because he went around preaching the good news constantly. He wasn't an apostle, but he was preaching good news constantly. And in Acts 8.4, remember after Stephen was stoned, it said, and on that day, a great persecution broke forth and the church was scattered. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem, but the church, all the believers were scattered from Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And you know what it said after that? And it says that they were preaching the word wherever they went. Who was preaching the word? Not the apostles. They weren't out there doing that. They were in Jerusalem, but it was the church. It was you and I going out, living our life, and telling those people that we encountered about the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what we saw the early church doing. Jesus says, 
All authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Go and make disciples of all nations. So go and make disciples is a command he's giving, right? Of all nations. How do you make disciples? You baptize them and you teach them to obey all that I command you. And what did he just command them to do? Go and make disciples. And so disciples should be people who make disciples. Amen? That's what we're about. Disciples making disciples. Every one of us is responsible for missions. Personally in our own life. And you know what? We will stand before Christ one day. The judgment seat of God. Christ will be by our side. And it, it won't be, what did your church do for missions? It'll be, what did you do? Remember the, the, the talents, the, the parable of the talents? We don't want to bury the gifts that God gave us in the ground just so, so on the day that we stand before him, we say, here's the things you gave me. I'm giving them back to you. He wants us to be about his business, which is kingdom expansion, which is telling people who he is. All right, finally, methods for missions in the, in the, in the New Testament. And so basically... Um, I, I'm not going to expand this very much. There's a lot I could say about this, but I just want to wrap it up because I think we all get the idea. We know what missions are. We know what the mission of the church is. And my, my ultimate goal is, like as a family, um, I sat down last night, we want to refocus and make sure that missions is constantly before us, the mission of the church personally in, in, in each of our lives, but as a family, so that we, we're more targeted and we're doing what God calls us to do, which is actually to say, you know, with Paul, he said, how will they hear if someone doesn't speak the word? Or how will they believe if they don't hear the words? He, Paul knew that they had to hear God's words in order to be saved, that that's how that process starts. And so we need to be out there. But what we saw with Paul is that he selected certain spots to go to. He, he selected certain cities when he went on these trips that he went on. And he selected them purposefully because of their geographical location, because of their importance. He couldn't hit every place in the world, but he hit the places that seemed to matter. And so he picked his points. And what we also see with Paul, I, I would say, so select, selecting his preaching points means that he was purposeful about the mission of the church. He kept that in the forefront of his mind and he thought about it. And, and you know, it wasn't just something that he was adrift. He had a purpose and a plan. But number two, we see that, that the method for his missions was prayer and preaching okay he knew preaching was primary we had to get the word of god into people's hearts and if they don't hear the word of god they won't be converted doesn't matter what other i can stand up here and talk about self-help stuff all day long but unless you hear the word of god it doesn't matter no one's going to be converted unless they hear the word of god because it's god's word that they that changes them and so he knew he had to go preach, but he also was a man of prayer. And he constantly prayed about the people, the lost. He constantly prayed for the people that he preached to, that they would draw nearer to God. He was a man who prayed for the lost, prayed for the people that heard his word, and prayed that God would continue to work in them and through them. He was a man known for prayer. And the last one is establish indigenous churches. You know, he established indigenous churches. And I think that's something that's really important. It used to be really important in the Christian church. We used to be really good about establishing sister churches and stuff like that. And it seems like it kind of goes up and down on how important it is. But then that's really important. Is this I think with the whole movement of mega churches, they kind of lost the whole... The, importance of establishing local congregations but i mean that's what you see in the new testament is establishing these local congregations and we see paul telling timothy that wherever he went you know he says make sure that there's elders in every town that that, that so that they can be self-governing that these churches can have a leadership that will pray and, and that will work on behalf of the of the believers there he wanted to make sure that every area had its own leadership. 
<coughs> pardon me. So uh, establishing self-governing churches was critical. And the other thing was self-supporting. Paul sought to establish self, self-supporting churches. And that is, I think, critical because if you're not doing number one and two, you're not going to do number three. And number three is self-propagating. So when a church is established, that church's goal should be to establish another church, just like as Christians, right? We go and make disciples who go and make disciples who go and make disciples. Churches should be the same way. When we establish a group of people somewhere, their goal should be I mean, the goal for them should be self-governing, self-supporting, and self-propagating. And that's kind of what we see in the New Testament for missions. Amen? Any questions? Who's going to go out and preach today? Nope. In your travels, preach Christ. The last song is I Surrender All, page 408, Allison. Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to the close with prayer. Oh, Father God, we thank you so much for this day and for this time that we've had to gather here to lift our voices in praise to you and prayers and Lord to hear your word as we uh, have studied missions and studied the, the purpose of the church. Lord, you tell us that you plan a purpose for our lives before we were born and that you work all things for the good of those who love you that you are with us you are our helper and you desire that we accomplish the, the purpose that's set before us and so lord this morning i just pray your blessing on each person here that you will give them your strength your spirit of encouragement the courage that they need so that each of us when presented with the opportunity can go and be your voice, the, the, a voice for you to not only be your hands of compassion, not only be your, your feet that go out, but that will speak words of truth in people's lives that they can see who you are and realize that your love is there for them and that they too can have the promise of salvation the freedom from the bondage of sin. We thank you, Lord, for all that you are and all that you do. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.